Hello and welcome to another episode of the Guns on Pegs podcast. My name is George Brown. I'm editor at Guns on Pegs and head of inspiration at Scribehound. His name is Chris Horn. He's the founder and CEO of both Guns on Pegs and Scribehound. Say hello, Chris. Hello. How are we, George? You've had your first day out. I have. Uh, yes, we're recording on Wednesday and we had our first day at home here on the farm on Saturday. It was, uh, well, I wouldn't say call it an unqualified success, but it was a success. Um, we shot 49, seven pigeons, um, and uh, a good time was had by all. It was really nice. We've got uh, one or two things that I think we can hope to improve on for the next time out, which is in about 10 days' time. But yeah, just really, really nice to be out. The kids came along. Um, I was going were... to say, I saw a lovely, lovely picture of the, the children standing with a couple of cartridges next to you. Yes, um, they, they they said they were loading. Um, I'm not convinced that they would have made things much <laughs> faster, but happily, ours is not the sort of shoot where you need to reload too quickly anyway. Um, so that was fine, but they absolutely loved it. They, they've been coming out since they were nine months old, uh, and so it's pro- they're properly indoctrinated now, I think. But yeah, it was a really nice family day. It's not ideal to have a loader four foot lower than where you open your gun at, is it? <laughs> True. The big worry is that they'll have pocketed a cartridge and then they'll take the coat into nursery um, because we did have a slightly stern email from nursery uh, last year when they'd both gone in with empty cartridges in their pockets and they said, we don't think this is appropriate for them to be bringing to nursery. And my, my protestations that it was really just a piece of plastic didn't really seem to go down all that well. <laughs> this reminds me, right? This similar thing happened. My my stepsister, uh, she was a bit older. I think she was about 10 at the time. My dad had bought some grouse back and was, uh, you know, basically dressing up the grouse in the workshop. And she came in and was like, oh, what's this? Da, da, da. Took one of the grouse feet. You know, they've got their lovely little white feet. <laughs> she pocketed the foot and took that into school. <laughs> <laughs> to which obviously the teachers are like why has she got a bird's foot in school <laughs> amazing but you've had a red letter day as well chris i have i i've had one of the most special days i'll ever have um i was out on monday with edward king previous podcast guest um and i took cora our dog for her first day out on the peg she'd been away she'd been uh to stand behind me uh sorry stand behind the line couple of times last year a bit nervous about it because she was she's quite a little timid dog but she excelled herself so I had a lovely time and it it basically is <laughs> lots of people talk about this it's changed shooting for me now because every bird is worth two you get to shoot it and then you get the retrieve and both are of equal fun <laughs> so uh that was lovely so was she absolutely perfect all the way through some stuff to work on or yeah, obviously there's loads to work on. Like towards the end of the day, she got a bit more confident, a bit overexcited, and stopped listening to the whistle on one particular occasion. But otherwise, I, she was way better than I thought she'd be. Uh, so yeah, she tur- They say this about dogs, especially labs and stuff, and, and spaniels. They turn into like something else when they're on when they're out on the shoot day. So um, yeah, it was brilliant, lovely. And so oh, she's out again on our podcast day on Friday. I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to seeing her work. Um, but that's really nice. I, I'm so pleased that it went well. One for Ben Randall there. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> um, right. Shall we introduce our guest? Indeed. So today we are joined by the CEO of British Game Assurance, the organization that was set up to assure and promote game meat that is now becoming Eat Wild. And we're going to get onto that in a minute. Uh, she is co-founder of Women Who Work in Field Sports. You might have seen her doing wonderful cookery demos at many events, including the Game Fair and loads of others where not a lot of shooting people attend, getting people into game, uh, or heard her on her own podcast, the Eat Wild podcast. A huge warm welcome to Louisa Clutterbuck. Hello. How are you both? Good, good. How are you? Yeah, very well, thank you. Very, um, it's very blustery out, but it's uh, all good. But it's been a bit manic because we obviously announced last week about the transfer, so <laughs> haven't really stopped. But yeah, all very well, thank you. It's great to have you with us, Louisa. Have you had your first day out this se- this season? I did. I got my first ever invitation through work, um, and I got, <laughs> yeah, I know. I <laughs> I have only been working at the BGA for over five years, um, and I've got a partridge day at Berryley which was incredible oh very nice Um, yeah and I also took my uh, Labrador out for the first time on her own without her mother 
and she behaved much better than when her mother was there. So yeah, it went very well. <laughs> That's absolutely fantastic. Is that Beardy down in Hampshire? Yeah, Bill T- Turret Drake's place. Yeah, yeah. I love it. S- saw him last night at book launch. Uh, very good. Yeah. You're part of the world, George. It is very much my part of the world. And I know Bill quite well as well because he's, uh, I, th- I think I've said this before on the podcast, he was president of my cricket club for, for quite a long time. Um, and I played cricket with both of his boys. Uh, yeah, I know that uh, that part of the world very well. Um, it, I've never shot there, but it looks like a, a very nice part of the world for shooting. Yeah, the, the, the last drive, I think, was beyond my uh, my skills. They were flying so high and so fast. But uh, it was an, an amazing thing to experience. Good, as long as you enjoyed yourself. That's what matters. Correct. So we like to set things off and, and start as we mean to continue, really. Um, and we do that by having a little drink. Um, so I'm going to ask you, Louisa, what's that you're drinking? I am a very proud Herefordshire girl. So I'm drinking a Henry Weston's vintage cider. Um, and also one of the main reasons is I, I don't allow myself these very often because they're very alcoholic <laughs> and um, <laughs> they are also very sugary. But on the Friday before we host one of our shoot days and I'm making 11s uh, for everyone I always let myself have one or two which means I'm always a bit pissed by the time all my friends arrive for dinner <laughs> <laughs> that's perfect um, but yeah though. I absolutely love it so you're you're going to claim that Herefordshire is the home of the best cider aren't you yes I've had long discussions with Digby about this um <laughs> And I think you may be Chris, actually. Uh, I did actually have my first Aspals in Su- Suffolk and it was yeah. very good, but it, it, it's it's no no Westerns, I'm afraid. It is the best, though, Aspals. I don't think there's no, any disputing not it. Not Westerns, without a doubt. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> we'll leave <laughs> that one. Overruled, Chris. <laughs> well, well, I've gone to Suffolk, actually, so I'll, I'll chip in straight away with what I've got because... Uh, I grew up in Suffolk, so that's why I'm obviously loyal to Aspals. And today I have a Suffolk gin. Uh, I have Fisher's gin. Don't think I've had it on the pod before. I, I'm fairly proud of the fact I think only once I've repeated a drink. And I think it was for the game fair where we kind of had to. Anyway, Fisher's gin uh, made in Albra, for those that know it, right on the beach. Uh, literally getting battered pretty much by the waves. Uh, and when you buy a bottle, they give you this lovely little bag of dried oranges, like little sliced oranges. So that's gone in. Topped off with a Yorkshire tonic, our friends up there. So, yep, lovely. Suffolk gin and tonic. Very nice. So you're claiming that because it's got a different gin in it, it's not the same drink as the other gin and tonics that you've had on this podcast. Is that what you're saying? (laughs) That's more than a claim. There's absolutely no way that a gin and tonic classes all gins and gin and tonics. Ooh, I don't know. That's like saying, ooh. You had a wine on the podcast, therefore you own, you you've had wine. You cannot have wine again. That's rubbish. <laughs> and the same uh, with yeah, whiskey. Or okay. you had whiskey once. No, no, all whiskey's the same, George. You know this. They are all identical. <laughs> well, probably right. You're probably right. I was just stirring. No. <laughs> what have you got? Whiskey. Yes, I have. <laughs> I have got whiskey. I've got um, a, a supermarket whiskey, but no, it's no, it's a single malt. Um, and the most notable thing about it, apart from the fact that it's um, Tamna Vullen is the name, is that it, the bottle cost me twenty five pounds, which is amazing. I can't help but feel I was charged the wrong amount. I feel like it should have been at least thirty five, because um, I feel like twenty five doesn't cover the tax. So I'm very pleased about that. And the only slight downside is I've nearly finished the bottle. So I'm going to have to go and find another one at some point soon. But yeah, it's very nice. It's, you know, it's not, it's nothing particularly special, but... Um, special enough to be worth 35, not 25. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, um, and special enough for four o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty special then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, Louisa, now that we've all got a drink, what we'd like to do, first of all, is turn to our post bag. And we uh, like to ask our listeners to send in their shooting quandaries and queries and dilemmas. And I'm not quite sure if this one fits into any of those, but it's a section we call Whose Bird Is It Anyway? And this episode's Whose Bird Is It Anyway? submission comes from somebody who emailed pod at gunsonpegs.com, who I have decided to call Ain. And Ain writes, Dear George and Chris... Thank you for saying you would listen to the views of your members. Here is my opinion. The two recent podcasts where you as hosts and your guests, Johnny and Simon, tried to paint this perfect picture of how game shooting should be. 
it's completely unrealistic and makes me feel that somehow, as a gun, I don't meet your expectations. Many shoots are now commercial, and it can be a gun's only access to shooting. For a shoot to run a day, they normally need a bag of 150 to 200 to make it viable. Perfect doesn't exist, and what happens when the antis find out how many of the so-called harvest are actually fit for human consumption? I speak to game dealers. You and I both know the percentages aren't good. I shot partridges twice last week, one 350 bird day, found through guns on pegs, and a 300 bird day on the Friday. The second shoot wouldn't meet the criteria for best practice. I could tell the birds hadn't been on the ground long. Where do you draw the line with your principles? Personally, I don't shoot ducks now because of how one particular shoot was run, but I'm not sure that some partridge shoots are much better, i.e. birds being released just prior to shooting and topping up, maize cover crops only, etc. However, the point is that it is for the shoot to decide what to offer and for the gun to decide whether to take the day. Guns on pegs should not become the morality police. You are also intimating by going on about the food aspect that it's wrong for me to enjoy shooting for the sport. Perhaps you have to be guarded about what you say on a public podcast. Guns on Pegs is a fantastic platform that has revolutionized shooting availability. Please don't spoil it. Hey, welcome to the pod, Louisa. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm not sure if Ain meant us to uh, read that out, but I think it's good that we are. Why not? Uh, George, just before we move any further and discuss this bit by bit dissected, uh, Ayn, give us your thoughts. Why have you uh, called it Ayn? Ayn as in Ayn Rand, who is a famous sort of libertarian thinker, philosopher, novelist type person. She, she very famously thought that everybody should just be allowed to do what they want kind of thing. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm, not sure I've, I'm not sure <laughs> I've really grasped the nuances of, of the philosophy there, but um, that was the best I could come up with. It's very good. Okay, this needs some dissecting. Uh, Just a very quick, and I'm literally going to keep this under 10 seconds recap for those that haven't listened to those podcasts. Do go and listen to them. They were heated at times. We're talking about best practice assurance. Coincidentally, this is lovely that Louisa is here. Wasn't even picked for you specially. This is timely. We're talking about social license. We're talking about net biodiversity um, gain. We're talking about sustainability, and we are arguing a number of things that we can try and do as Guns on Pegs to look after the future of shooting. We've been debating quite publicly about what we can do, what our challenges are to achieve that. Summarised? Pretty good, yeah. So, (laughs) uh, from what you heard, Louisa, is there anything you want to chip in with straight away? Is there any particular bit of what he said that's got your grill up? I I think we should all be the morality police, you know, when it comes to shooting. Otherwise, it's not going to continue. I don't, I don't understand why he's just picking on you guys. Because <laughs> <laughs> we put our head above the parapet, I expect. I think there's a really interesting bit that I think you can probably talk about, Louisa, which is um, the the number of birds that end up uh, with game dealers that then cannot enter the food chain for any reason at all. I mean, that's basically what BGA was set up to try and combat as much as anything, wasn't it? Yeah, we were set up to make sure that every bird enters the food chain. Um, There is no data on how many birds enter the food chain. And over the last five years, we have tried to gather that information. Um, I'm sure you guys are aware that people are quite secretive within shooting. So trying to understand exactly where people's game is going, you know, where the game dealer is sending it is really, really challenging. Uh, it's something that you know now we're eat wild and this is going to be our sole focus that i i want to get more data because obviously you know with the census how important it it is to have that data we know that the game markets increased seven percent but does that mean that more game is going into the food chain we don't know we don't we just don't have that that answer i'm afraid goodness so his point about game in the food chain i think Look, I, when the antis find out, I don't think there's much in that. I think there's lots of other markets where things uh, could be, well, if people were aware how bad they were. I mean, take salmon farming for one, much, much worse than the game. Uh, so I don't think that's a big issue there. Uh, I, I, well, sorry, I'll rephrase that. I don't think that's quite as 
the way he positions it in terms of what the antis think. I think it's something we should be looking to improve. Game handling is critical, like quality game mm-hmm. handling. Yeah. And what I think he's actually referring to is the number of birds that meet the game dealer, which then are not fit, i.e. they have gone green rather than being like badly shot or badly picked by dogs. And going green can essentially be solved by chilling that bird quickly. We know that shoots don't respect that enough as they as they could. And that basically would change that stat enormously. We know that that, that has increased since the 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 game dealers have reported that birds have been coming to them in a much better state since BGA was set up. So that's a really positive uh, thing going forward. And obviously there are a lot of companies also that are doing pet food with game, but I'm not a huge fan of that because I think it undermines, you know, what could be a really good meat resource. Yes, that's a very good point. I, well, yeah, well, can, I mean... I, can I link that? Can I link that to one of his other points, which is you were intimating by going on about the food aspect, that it's wrong for me to enjoy shooting for the sport. I don't think we did say that. I think I think that's fundamental. I think going out and enjoying shooting is absolutely... I mean, if we didn't do that, like, we, what's the point? But of course we, we enjoy going shooting, but we're saying that's not everything, right? And if you were going, going shooting and you knew the only use of that game was going to pet food, I reckon a lot of people would just stop. Yeah. Clearly this guy wouldn't. Well, I mean, that's up to him, isn't it? And also when you're explaining shooting to someone, just saying, oh, but I really enjoy it. That just doesn't work. I've, I've tried. <laughs> <laughs> oh, to, to an outsider, yeah, yeah. yeah you, to some... you'd, you'd love it, you just don't know it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, you know, actually, we, we did say that. I remember saying, I'm pretty sure it was on the podcast with Johnny, saying it is absolutely fine to say I just like shooting. You know, that's okay. But certainly for me, the fact that it's also putting food on the table is a really big part of it. You know, we shot here at home on Saturday. Um, There were a few brace left at the end of the day. And I took great pleasure in uh, in dressing and and filleting those birds on Sunday. And then my family and I had a very nice partridge and mushroom risotto on Sunday evening. And, you know, that was as much part of the, the shoot day for me as the pulling of the trigger. But I, for example, I don't shoot woodcock because I don't like the taste of them. So I won't kill one because I'm not going to eat yeah. it. So- it. Exactly. I, and that, I, I've just like you, Louisa, for many, many years, I didn't either. And my taste buds changed over the years. And now I actually really enjoy it. And But again, like there's times, you know, there's practice for shooting woodcock, you know, follow guidelines for me, 1st of December, you know, that sort of stuff. Like, yeah, I think so. He then goes on to say he actually found another shoot which wouldn't meet the criteria for best practice in his eyes. But I think what he's saying is that he then would vote with his feet and he wouldn't go there again, which is great. Yeah, that's exactly what we want people to do. But also if they could send us photos of anything that might be uh, wrong, then we can get an auditor out there and actually see if there is bad practice going on. And, And so he then, when he goes on to say guns on pegs should not become the morality police, but if he's found a shoot, that he doesn't think meets... Pra- we want to know about it. We'll get rid of it off the website because we, of course we should be taking that shoot down or we should be advising people not to go to these places. We shouldn't just let the next person go and find out for themselves. I don't. I, th- I just think that's entirely wrong. We've got a duty to do our best. Well, I mean, there's two things here, right? One, the, the sort of long-term viability of shooting is part of Guns on Pegs' sort of mission statement and, and, and part of our, our, um, our values. Um, but also, we'd quite like our business to be here in twenty years or so. And if <laughs> yeah, exactly. we think there are, if the, we think there are shoots out there that are jeopardising that future, then we have absolutely every right to, from a, just a purely business perspective, to say, well, we are not going to support. You know, we just don't I, want them associated with our brand. And if we think they, that 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 what they're doing is putting the whole future of shooting in jeopardy, of course, we're going to take them down. I mean, that would just be a, sensible business. And there's a really important point here because in most industries, this would just be a business decision. This is shooting. There are business decisions and then there's personal decisions based on our personal values within Guns on Pegs. I would happily forego revenue in the business if I knew that it would have an impact, positive impact on sustainability of shooting. I'd do it now. Now, that's not a business decision necessarily. I mean, it could be from a sort of future, you know, shoring up the future, but I'm not thinking of it that way. This is the right thing to do. And I think that when he's saying, you know, you should not become the reality piece, I just completely disagree. 
I think we should do whatever we can to try and make shooting more sustainable. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And also maybe talk to the person that runs the shoot and ask and question them. Because then maybe that, that person will be like, oh, ooh, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. People actually are aware of what's going on. Do you know, that's a really interesting point because, you know, you mentioned the census just now. We have a question in both the shoot owner census and the game shooting census that basically says how important is best practice to you. And consistently, year after year, shoots underestimate how important it is to guns. I can't remember the stats off the top of my head. Yeah, it's, but... it's like it's double out of kilter. It's miles out. I, th- I think it was like two thirds of guns really value it. And two thirds of shoots said that they didn't value it at all. The guns <laughs> didn't value it at all. Like It was totally at opposite with each other. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but I think I think it's also important to say, like, he. I, I, I'd like to address this bit, which is he says that he now feels that he doesn't meet our expectations. And I think this is maybe where I am a bit of a libertarian about it which is, look, I'm not judging you. I have the standards that I value, the things that I value about shooting and the, the types of things that I like to do. Um, I'm not going to stop you from doing it. You know, My desire to shoot a 350 bird day isn't all that strong. I don't, don't object to you doing it particularly. I'm very happy doing what I do. Yeah, that's what shooting's all about. We've all got our own preferences. So you know, it's a it's quite a broad church in that sense about what people like. You know, he's saying here, look, I don't shoot ducks now because of how one particular shoot was run. Uh, fine. So he's already said he has his preference. I actually I'm with him on that. I don't really like shooting. I love wild fowling. I see that totally different to rear duck. I just don't shoot rear duck. Just not not my cup of tea. Same. That's fine. A lot of other people love it. I'm not going to stop them doing it. Be my guest. Where I do have an issue is if the shoot's handling it in a really bad way or if the game's not going into the food chain or something. That's different. Gosh, it's all got very deep. <laughs> like he's he's emailed us saying he's not agreeing with us. And I I feel like we're in agreement, apart from the morality thing. We're in agreement with nearly everything he says. Right. Well, thank you very much for that. It's, it's always in. I think it's actually really important that we talk about these things. Um, I don't think it gets talked about enough and you know there'll definitely be some people who think we're yeah. completely wrong and you know fine yeah. again email us and tell us we're wrong again it's fun yeah um, we'll read it out and we'll discuss I love it good thank you Ayn so Chris <laughs> um, I, I feel like we've had an unpopular opinion but um, let's have another one <laughs> <laughs> this unpopular opinion comes from someone that George has called Brontes Brontes? I'd say Brontes. Um, <laughs> the other day, uh, I was watching shooting videos on YouTube and found a video of a high bird pheasant, of high bird pheasant shooting in Scotland featuring a very well-known game shot. He was double gunning, and his shooting was always incredible with bird after bird being knocked down with machine-like efficiency. He and his loader were getting on well, keeping up an impressive rate of fire, and that is when I developed my unpopular opinion which is that we should get rid of stuffers, loaders, and double gun days on reared bird shoots in the UK. Shooting double guns or stuffing should still be allowed on covey species such as grouse and wild grey partridges because they are unpredictable in abundance and must be harvested efficiently when numbers can sustain taking the shootable surplus. Also, there is a table market for grouse, and I doubt you would have trouble getting rid of any excess greys taken on a once in a lifetime big day couple of points must come back to in there however watching that video i just thought what's the point if those birds were that testing that you have to have a rate of fire to achieve the bag why not load for yourself slow down and shoot less while and still enjoying amazing sport i know double gunning is an art but when shooting reared birds surely it's more about greed rather than for the experience of shooting with a loader for its own sake very interesting the first thing i would like to say is don't believe everything you see on youtube <laughs> editing <laughs> editing is very very effective at making it look like people never miss um let's just sure. let's just keep that in mind <laughs> maybe we should make this should be a little game now george we should just put p- videos of you up on youtube never missing and you will get <laughs> talked about as one of the greatest shots you will have to do a <laughs> lot of filming to get even a short video <laughs> Go on. Who wants to go and offer some thought on this unpopular opinion? So we have to decide now that we think this is popular or unpopular. Louisa, have you um, have you ever shot on a double gun day? Uh, no, 
<laughs> That's what I was just thinking. I have absolutely zero experience. The only time that people load for me are usually when it's one of like my best girlfriends who don't know how to shoot. And I love having them on the peg to chat. So, um, <laughs> yeah. And and as we've already as we've already discussed, I've also not shot a double gun day. And as we discussed, um, having my kids loading for me as they were at the weekend definitely didn't increase my rate of fire. <laughs> 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 but Chris, you're, you, you move in exalted circles. You must have done some double gunning. I've done quite a bit of double gunning. And I have to say, I'm with this person. I haven't done it for a while. And I will tell you, the last time I went on a day and I was told it was double guns, I deliberately packed my side-by-side single gun and I said to him, I won't be requiring a loader. Sorry, I will load from my own pocket. I just, it just wasn't up for it. And I shot just as many as the others on the day. Uh, it made bugger all difference. And the ratio on the day from the team of guns was 14 to one, different issue altogether. I shot the low ones out the side and had a whale of a time. And um, yeah, I, I... Having done it quite a lot, and I've loved it, I will be honest, when I first started shooting, or, you know, first day double gunning on pheasants down on Exmoor, like, that was, like, the best thing that ever happened. It was amazing. But I think, in time, I've sort of come to write, arrive at this person's opinion, too. Unnecessary. Why do we do it? Just, just, just literally the rate of excitement from pulling down birds, and I, I don't know. So when you're double gunning, do you still remember each bird you've killed? No, of course you don't. No, yeah. So that, yeah. So I would probably agree. I don't think you need it then. So I, I've just realised that I did just, I just to, to tell tell a little bit of a porky pie. I have done some double gunning, but only on clays. Um, and my lasting memory of that is that after about three minutes, my arms were giving up. <laughs> <laughs> I was admittedly using, you know, a, a, a pair, a couple of big, heavy, but at least by you know, compared to my side by side, big, heavy over and unders, uh, the sort of gun that I'm not used to using. But I just think like as a, like as a physical thing, I think it would get quite uncomfortable quite quickly, double gunning, unless it was completely necessary or does the adrenaline kick in and you don't feel it. Yeah, of course you're like, you get tired, <laughs> but like, so double gunning, I've double gunned on grouse and it is just unbelievable, right? You know, you understand, as he's saying, you understand the unpredictable abundance of grouse, how they come through the line. You need to get on top of them because of the surplus levels they need to meet. You need to double gun in those scenarios to be able to get the numbers required. So you understand your role and why you have those guns. Where I've started to become confused with double gunning on pheasant shooting or partridge shooting is just walk through the cover slower. Like you could drag out that day if you want to hit that bag. You don't need a double gun. The only reason you would is your single gun will get so bloody hot you need to cool it down. But then it comes back into a whole load of other questions, doesn't it? I Interesting. I, I I definitely think that like I mean, this is again again this is my personal point of view. Um, I have never been on a day where I've thought, do you know what would have made that better is if I'd been shooting at you know four rounds a minute rather than two I, I, that's just not a feeling that i've ever had now i think it's probably also true that i wouldn't say no just so that i experienced it so pa paint this as a scenario right you're on a lovely day you're let's say it's a even let's just say it's a farm shoot with like i say that in a, in a sense that it wouldn't be a normal sort of double gunning shoot a lovely bird comes over and you shoot it with a second barrel and immediately behind it is another beautiful bird that you're not going to see for another two weeks what do you wish? Well, it's funny you should say that because uh, a similar scenario happened this weekend where um, I had uh, had both barrels at a pheasant and uh, as I was breaking my gun, uh, a decent partridge came over and my neighbour shot it nice. because he knew that I was unloaded. And about 30 seconds before that, I had shot one over his head that he hadn't seen. So we had this lovely little tit for tat interaction, and I thought it was rather good. I actually have a fr uh, friends who are a couple, and um, she takes her gun out and stands with him. When he's loading, she will put her gun in the air. Um, oh goodness! Yeah, it's very unorthodox. The old guys on the shoot weren't very impressed, but well, that, you know. that's kind of like having two people on the peg. That's why <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of people who'd be hopping mad. <laughs> It was quite a surprise on the first drive, I have to say. 
Uh, to, to be fair, it reminds me of a scenario when I was quite young. I must have been like 17, 18. I went loading for my dad and he missed a nice bird with both barrels and we were double gunning, right? And I just shot it out the back with a, before, rather than handing the gun to him. <laughs> <laughs> so what you did is you wiped your dad's eye despite also being his loader. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but the, only, only in a father and son scenario can you get away with doing that. <laughs> Yes. I, I don't know about this. I, 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 my inclination is that I don't really see the point in double gunning on on reared birds. Um, I, think, I think I'm probably in agreement. I don't know. Louisa? Yeah, I agree. And I, I, can, I, can I coin one of something George said? I, I can't get it word for word. But like, I don't want to... My personal opinion is I'm not that bothered. Like, I don't really see the point like you. But I'm not going to stop someone else doing it. Philly Boots, enjoy yourself. Like, go crack on. But I'll come back to our earlier correspondence. Fill your boots, providing the game's going in the food chain, the shoot meets best practice. Done. Yeah. Then do what you like. That's the whole point of this shooting thing. We're just saying there needs to be a little bit of boundaries around certain things so we can defend it. And if you want to shoot double guns, I don't care about bag size as long as it meets best practice and it goes in the food chain. I'd love to know if people who shoot double guns consume twice as much game as people who <laughs> George we've done the numbers on this <laughs> yeah I know they're not good <laughs> oh no yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah someone was telling me about a vegan who's like one of the, he takes a lot of days a, a year but he he's a vegan so he never eats game which blows I my brain I've got a big issue with that is he a, obviously not a vegan for moral reasons then well, no, it's a exactly. diet, <laughs> diet thing rather than a. Yeah, maybe they're allergic to meat. Let's go right, with that. Right, right, hold on. Can we just chuck, can we just chuck this in as Louise's correspondence to the pod? I know someone who is a vegan who takes a lot of days shooting. Uh, I don't think this is correct. Popular or unpopular? Like, surely we're getting unanimous verdicts from the shooting community on that one, no? Usually the vegans are um, the easiest to convert to game. So That's a very uh, good... Yeah, it's interesting, that. Um, I think they must be allergic. I think that's the only way you're allowed to shoot and not eat it. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're absolutely right about converting vegans. Like the, the whole sort of eat what you hunt is quite defendable. That's what, isn't that what Mark Zuckerberg does? Isn't he, he's a vegan apart from stuff he hunts. But in America, it's not legal to eat what you've hunt, you've hunted. No, it's not legal to sell. Oh, not only good to sell it. Okay, yeah. But apparently, California has quite a booming game. Um, so the US is actually on my hit list. So interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. I, if I was going to um, try and turn a vegan into a meat eater, I'm not sure I'd go straight to game. I'd probably go to like a smoked shredded chicken from the Chinese takeaway or something, or maybe <laughs> my, a bacon <laughs> sandwich. <laughs> My sister was a vegetarian and uh, I started uh, eating a little bit of venison and then a bit of pheasant that I shot. Um, and now she's back to being a full-blown meat eater and went out shooting with me last year. So, <laughs> <laughs> Good work. <laughs> there needs to be a league table for this, by the way, the number of com converted people by well, we the also, shooting we, community. <laughs> we went to Bristol a few years ago and we chose it because it had the highest populations of vegans. And um, we we got quite a few vegans tasting it because a lot of them had given up meat for um, uh, carbon reasons, you know, climate change region reasons. Mm. So yeah. that's interesting. Is that what you, that's that's what you found? Yeah, one of the biggest reasons people don't give up meat is usually due to um, climate change. Yeah, and it, and if you're if you're against uh, factory farming on moral grounds, but you you're not sort of uh, you don't object to to eating meat on animal rights grounds then you know game is a great alternative you know if you like free range if you if you like organic um then you know game is game is where it's at right yeah um, and, food. and we've talked about this i think we, maybe it was with mike robinson we were talking about you know if you really like climate change uh if you want to no, no i've got that wrong not if you like <laughs> climate change if you don't like climate change then uh, eating venison is a bloody good way to make sure there's more trees. Yeah, I've got a new hashtag, eat a deer, save a tree. <laughs> save lots of trees. <laughs> Although I appreciate that's not as good a hashtag. It's really basic marketing though. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so are we gonna, let's do the vote. Uh, unpopular or popular opinion, Louisa? I think popular, I agree with them. Don't need loaders. 
Chris? Yeah, well, I, I agree with him. I don't I couldn't comment on whether this is popular or unpopular. I'd actually really like to know. I agree with him on, on his reasoning. You? Yeah. Uh, I agree. I agree. I think his reasoning is sound, I, but I think I'm going to say unpopular because I don't think we should stop just because we don't, you know, I don't think we should stop people from doing it if they want to. But I think I, I wouldn't. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Yeah. Good. Right. So, uh, so Ayn, Brontes, and now you, Louisa, are all members of the most noble order of the Garters and will very soon be in receipt of a set of the much coveted, highly prized Guns on Pegs podcast shooting sock Garters. If you too have got a shooting confession, quandary, or a query that you'd like us and our guests to help you with, or if you've got an unpopular opinion, you'd like to tell us about a forgotten drive or tell us that we're wrong about any of the things that we have said just now, please do drop us an email to pod at gunsonpegs.com and you will qualify for some garters if we read it out. So, Louisa, the listeners need to understand, first of all, what's the BGA and where did it come from? It's really important for the rest of this conversation. But So the BGA was set up about five and a half years ago. Uh, to address the problem of, well, two two problems, uh, making sure that every bird entered the food chain, which I've alluded to already, and also to bring in self-regulation so that the government um, couldn't enforce laws onto us and we could prove that we were getting our house in order and basically demonstrate that shoots are adhering to best practice and benefiting the environment. So am I right in saying, hold on, wasn't, what was the BGA before, what was the A before Assurance? So we started, <laughs> yeah, we started British Game Alliance. That's and, it, it was British Game Alliance. So, but, because uh, I think one came before the other, if I remember correctly. It was very much marketing of game and getting game into the food chain. Yeah. And and the Assurance sort of came as a res- reason to, well, as the, as the requirement to actually do a good job at that. Is yeah, right? we've, so we found that most, one of the main reasons that a lot of retailers, restaurants, pub groups, hotels, etc., hadn't taken game before because there was no traceability and there wasn't an assurance scheme like Red Tractor. So that's why we needed the assurance scheme to be able to open up the new market. I think people massively don't understand that. Yeah. George, what do you reckon? What's your, what's your opinion on that, of what the shooting community would understand of the BGA? I think I think you're absolutely right. I think a lot of people don't, I mean, I, this is probably true of all the organisations to, to a greater or less extent. A lot of people don't really know what the objective is a lot of the time. You know, they'll see that you know such and such a piece of advice has come out and they either like it or don't like it and they just don't really think about what the what the aim of it is um and i think that it's it's true in so many walks of life but it's certainly true in in this area about how organizations like supermarkets have to operate um, you know, if unless you are involved in that in some way, it's very difficult to get a feel for for what are the things that matters to, to that matter to those kind of businesses and things like mm. quality control. You know, um, I in my year abroad doing languages, I went and uh, did a work placement in the south of Spain where they grow all the salad, all the lettuce for the UK supermarkets and. Mm. The thing that was most important is consistency and quality, you know, and and if you fail to meet those criteria, uh, if if a, if they you know inspected a, a crate of or a pallet of lettuce and it had too many packages with mud on the lettuce or the lettuces were ever so slightly different sizes to you know mm. that, that 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 breached some standard that the grower had 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 signed up to the whole lot had to be taken out of its bags repackaged resorted out because they wouldn't put it on the shelf in that condition um and there were huge fines and you know so so that the way those businesses operate and the standards that they think the consumer demands are so strict and that makes a, a a fairly uncontrollable product like game an enormous risk for them and and we've got to separate out like that we must say to that rightly or wrongly 
because there's a lot of that that I think we oh, as consumers don't yeah. agree with. Like the whole wonky veg scenario, right? And I think there's most people now are just like, this is ridiculous. But the average consumer picks up, you know, the, the more desirable looking bit of veg, even though obviously it tastes the same. So rightly or wrongly, and also to add to, the, to your point, there is apps out there now where you can scan a barcode and see the traceability of that bit of food right the way from where it came from. You know, in game, we haven't got a Scooby-Doo. We're just behind the times. And so I can totally understand why these retailers that are at the forefront of uh, the, uh, you know, sort of consumer trends, just saying to, I'd, I'd rather not take the risk. I can see that. But they are now, thanks to the VGA. <laughs> 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 so, so, so you've obviously made good progress. And, and how important has assurance been to that progress? Well, Sainsbury's, you know, one of the largest supermarkets in the UK, had never taken game. Um, and, you know, three years ago, they started selling pheasant fillet that had the BGA logo on the front. So they would never would have done that if there wasn't that assurance scheme there in place. The problem now with supermarkets is um, lead, sadly. And it's one of the reasons, you know, for the last five years, supermarkets were our biggest that's where we wanted to be. You know, we wanted to be in everywhere from Asda to Tesco's, which I think are the last two that aren't selling uh, pheasant at the moment. Um, but because we actually haven't got enough lead-free birds to supply the supermarkets that are doing game, I don't want to try and get the others to do it because I'm going to be like, well, we haven't got enough for you. So, so that's that's a, that's a really interesting. So, there's two really interesting things there. One is that the the whole lead steel thing plays again into that need for the supermarket to have a product that they know their customers feel comfortable and safe eating. And you know, we're not getting to the arguments about whether lead is a problem or not. But if there is a perception of it being a problem, then it's just a hard no. Yeah, that's the social other- license. Everything is about perception. Yeah. And then, but then the other aspect is that it is it it then becomes a limiting factor because we can't, you know, the Sainsbury's and Tesco's. I don't know, Sainsbury's must be second biggest, is it? And 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 we can't, you know, that they they what you're saying is is that there potentially is demand there, but you can't even go and ask the question because we don't have the product to supply yeah. them. Exactly, and and to those that say well, screw the supermarkets. That's where I've got a real issue because the supermarkets are such an important part for the the visibility of game. They're a marketing tool for game. Having a line in a supermarket is worth a fortune for your your visibility. I think we have, if we want game to grow, you have to be in the supermarkets. End of story. Absolutely. And game, wild meat, as I like to refer to it. Um, I agree, yeah. uh, You know, the more... That the everyday person, when when I well sorry, the, you know someone who lives in a city, for example, sees it in front of them. So when they pop down to Tesco's, oh, it's on the shelf there. Oh, when they go to their lo- local restaurant, it's on the menu there. And oh, they go down to Arsenal or wherever, and oh, there's a game pie on the menu there. You know, all that contributes to them thinking it's a really commonplace, normal meat. Uh, yeah. So it's what we need to do. It's a huge challenge. So- <laughs> So, so, so can I ask a question then about the market for the distribution of game? Because I think it's common knowledge that a lot of game traditionally has gone abroad from the UK. 85%. Wow. Right. 85% of our game goes to, I think, predominantly Europe. And um, if Europe suddenly was to say that they're not accepting birds that are a shot, lead shot, what are we going to do with 85 percent of the game and, and 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 how likely is that i mean i know that the european chemicals agency has already uh, ag- agreed a movement away from lead and so they are putting that into europe and the uk is not part of that agreement it has to yeah. make its own decision so i mean do you have any uh, guidance on what are what was looking like there um so it's not looking great especially you know we we were actually very lucky that the Brexit border control stuff happened during lockdown when we weren't all out shooting because we had some really awful problems with that. And now ever since then, the border crossings for game are getting more and more difficult. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't think we're going to have that route 
for for much longer. And and is demand in Europe uh, stable? What what's yes, the trend they, like? They they absolutely love it, and it's 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 absolutely consistent. So culturally, there's a different market than the UK. They have there's, different. Yeah, there's tastes. absolutely no stigma around game in Europe that we have here. And and do the supermarkets price it at the same price as a lot of the other meats, or do they do what the UK do and sort of mark it up as to see it as a premium product? No, it's do definitely you know? not a premium. It's it's you know it's the same as everything else, and that's and that's the difference. I think it, it's really really interesting. So you know, my my wife is Slovak, and and when I was first telling her that that I go shooting, um, and and um, she'd never really eaten game. She was telling me that in Slovakia, um going shooting and eating game is almost a marker of being uh not terribly well off and people don't necessarily want to be seen to be eating game uh it because they want people to think that they are uh more middle class than they are (laughs) but at the same time pheasant soup is like an absolute classic of uh of slovak uh cuisine and last time i was out there i was actually shooting and um and my wife's family were like they said bring back as many as you can and they then made um absolutely gallons of pheasant soup and they, they were eating it for weeks and they were thrilled yeah as you guys are aware i've done quite a few trips uh through europe this year and every town i've stopped in there has been some form of game dish on the menu so it's just crazy <laughs> that we don't have the same here so demand in europe is consistently strong so the the eighty five percent is okay. It's slightly weird, but it's okay, as long as Europe doesn't have suddenly a blanket ban on lead, which is already being talked about and probably coming. Yeah. So the lead shot, steel shot debate in the UK is irrelevant. We have no choice because otherwise we're not going to be able to get our game consumed by humans. So what you shoot it with literally is doesn't matter have i interpreted that correctly does that logic make sense george uh yeah i mean it well no what you mean is that it becomes everything what you shoot your game with because yeah if we are all agreed which i think we are uh, as a community that our social license depends on the birds we shoot going into the food chain um although ain may beg to differ you know it it, it i think i think there's no question that that our, what social license we have depends on the, the birds being eaten. Um, I mean, I, I don't know if it, uh, it gives, it makes me very uncomfortable that so much of it goes abroad. I mean, it's great that there is a market for it, but it does mean that we then are less in control of the market. We have less, less um, ability to, to influence what happens. And so even though, um the uh that market exists i would still say that the one of the most important things we can do is to grow the market in the uk so that we are less reliant on that uh on that route because it could at any moment be undone by Absolutely. as it might be regulation uh around the import of game or or around lead and steel or or whatever like there's so much that could go wrong with that 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 we've got to um we've got to to hedge our bets against it going wrong i mean this this you've got i mean louisa we've all got our work cut out here but i mean a seven percent growth is great but i mean if we have to find an 85 percent growth we're stuffed (laughs) uh so yeah i'm not um, really sure i keep i keep wondering what i'm gonna do if that happens i think i I might leave Um, (laughs) But we need to be proud. It's a British produce. We need to be really proud of it. And, you know, what I say to people is if you are just, you know, if you're a gun and you're going to lots of different shoots, ask them where their game goes. What, you know, does it go to the local game dealer? What What's happening to it? And have an interest. And, you know, if it is going to a game dealer, maybe say, oh, well, are you going to go suggest potentially going lead free? Because if you're, you know, a small shoot where you're taking all the game home, you know, carry on shooting with your normal cartridges. But Mm. I, I said this to the um, the guy, lovely, lovely chap, uh, hosting on Monday. We were chatting at lunch and I said, you know, we had the normal shoot briefing and there wasn't any mention of steel or lead. And I said to him, it'd just be interesting. Can you imagine if you'd said, look, we here shoot steel 
uh, you know, it's not it's not fundamentally required yet. It's encouraged whilst we're in this transition. But we here shoot steel because our game goes to the local game dealer who happens to have a contract with MS and Waitrose. And we're really proud that our game ends up on the shelves of those supermarkets. So could you kindly please make sure you shoot steel? Because it's really nice to know that the game you shoot on this day goes to those supermarkets. If you said that in a shoot briefing, I think that would have quite a big impact on a lot of gum. Yes. And also, the, if if they have asked you to shoot steel, please do make sure you do it because one poor, poor shoot had to have their entire day's worth of game condemned because one person, or not condemned, sorry, but it didn't, it, you know, they didn't get any money for it because one person had decided to ignore him and shoot with lead. Oh my God. Goodness me. Yeah. Um, there is another aspect to this though that I'd like to touch on which is what difference would it make if instead of taking a brace home everyone took two brace home I think that'd be great I mean I'm when guns come to our shoot I make them take about six or seven <laughs> I'm can, awful. Can I offer, <laughs> but is it a drop in the ocean can I offer a horrible statistician answer to this Seven percent of the shoots shoot fifty percent of the birds. Yeah. So, so unfortunately, I think it would make no difference. There are some mm. guys that take do take the entire bag back on their private jet. You know, I, I've heard of this. There is a <laughs> yeah. very famous particular individual who flies them all back abroad. They're all processed on site immediately, treated with more respect than I've ever ever heard of at any other shoot. And I think it's wonderful. I mean. It's an interesting look, but it's brilliant that it's happening. <laughs> the inside of that private jet is an interesting place to be. <laughs> Do you reckon it's like fully like PVC'd and stainless steeled, like food standards? <laughs> Dexter, Dexter um, style. <laughs> yeah, it have to be aluminium. Won't I was it? going to say the anything to declare bit would be a bit interesting, but then I thought, no, he probably doesn't go through there in the airport. Um, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Um, I think we're at a point where we've got to move this on to the point we alluded to right at the start of this pod, which is the PGA has moved assurance to say, I'm going to, this is coming to you, Louisa. It's moved assurance to aim to sustain. You're going to explain why. And the PGA is becoming eat wild. That is correct, right? Have I got that right? That is absolutely correct. I'm really regretting having my Westerns now. <laughs> um. <laughs> It's a bit more than pub chat, this, isn't it? <laughs> I know, yeah. you're like, yeah, it's fine, it's really relaxed. Um, you know, so, <laughs> so obviously Aim to Sustain was set up uh, what, a year and a half ago. It seemed pretty natural then to me, um, before I was in post, that the assurance scheme would eventually go over to Aim to Sustain because when the BGA was set up, it was always agreed that it would be returned to the shooting community to be run by the shooting community. And, you know, aim to sustain is the NATO of the shooting world. You know, it, it, it tries to represent every part of shooting, which I think it does very well. And um, by having the scheme being endorsed by every shooting organization, we can hopefully have a much bigger take up because, you know, I'm sure it's not a secret that both bird flu and COVID have absolutely decimated our membership numbers. So I think it's a very positive step. And also it's been quite a challenge when talking to different sectors to explain that we're both an assurance scheme and a marketing body. So it hopefully will be much clearer messaging now that Eat Wild, Development Board for Game and the assurance scheme. And also it means that we can also represent other assurance schemes, not just the Aim to Sustain one. I, I love the move. Eat Wild is a brilliant name. We just said it already, wild food, like we've talked about that. I think the idea of eat wild just sits perfectly. Go and market the hell out of game, eat wild is your name. Lovely. And I agree entirely. Aim to sustain you unified backing of all organizations, talking about assurance. Everyone supports it, all the all the public bodies, it gives it a much better chance. Because I'm I'm right in saying that there is also a new uh venison assurance scheme, is that right? Or have I imagined that? No, yeah, it's Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so bad with acronyms. I think it's like the British well, Quality British Wild Venison Scheme. I will get better at remembering that. Um, but yeah, that has that has just launched as well. Why and is already, that separate? That's a shame. It has to be separate because it's a very different auditing process. Right. So just the auditing is separate because Eat Wild would stand 
for venison as well, right? Yes. So Eat Wild, we we cover all wild meat. So if you, if anyone is listening, you're a restaurant and you've never used any type of game before or wild meat, you would just call us up and we would be able to help educate you. We could, you know, help you with recipe development, all that sort of stuff for any wild meat, not just feathered game or venison. We're going to do hare, rabbit. I'd love to do trout, but that's a bit, that's a bit on the fence at the moment. <laughs> Well, you've got you've got Leon, your chef, right? So, so does he develop with in conjunction with these people to sort of help encourage them to take game on the menu? Yeah, so that's one of the key things that we have been doing for the last few years. Is that firstly we created sort of 12, 10 commercial recipes that we could literally give to a pub group or a hotel chain, and they can take that recipe and then use it on their menu. Because one of the biggest problems with game is a lot of chefs haven't been taught how to cook it. And they usually end up completely stuffing it up and it's too dry, overcooked, very tough. Um, But by providing them with these recipes and Leon going in and giving a bit of education, uh, it it actually shows them how wonderful game can be. Brilliant. They they do need help as well if they haven't done it before. And if you've taken the pain out of it for them, brilliant. So so there's that kind of... um... I suppose almost like B two B business to business type stuff, but you also do, and I think are planning to do a lot more kind of uh, sort of general public mass market outreach stuff as well. Is that right? Yes. So we did a uh, car fest, which was our first music festival this year, and boy, it was an eye opener. I really couldn't get over like the what is a venison. And what what game are you talking about? Like netball, hockey, like people, I honestly, I can't believe, I, I promise, I don't know how many people asked us those questions. So then oh that's when I suddenly was like, we've got to stop calling it game. We've got to call it wild meat. Oh my God, that's cracking research. That is like, the shooting community would not be aware of that. So yeah, this is something I have to, because people, a lot of people who are in the shooting community don't really understand what eat wild is or is trying to achieve. But the people that I'm trying to talk to with Eat Wild are not the shooting community. With you know, I'm trying to talk to someone in the inner city who's literally never seen a pheasant, doesn't know what a deer is, couldn't tell you the difference. You know, <laughs> what even is a deer? You know, what, let alone a fallow, a roe, whatever. And that's why we are launching a separate campaign, which is the Back British Game campaign, to talk to the shooting community about what we're doing with Eat Wild so that we don't have to change the messaging of Eat Wild, if that makes sense. So Back British Game, I mean, that does what it says on the tin, right? (laughs) Yeah, very similar to Back British Farming. Um, But sort of the strap line is Back British Game to ensure it will be there for the next generation to enjoy. I have an important question. Can I have a car sticker that says back British game, please? Yes. I actually this morning had a very exciting meeting choosing the logo and what collateral I'm going to make. And we're going to launch a little shop where people, you know, if you donate 10 quid, you'll get a car sticker and a badge and that sort of stuff. Brilliant. I'm yeah, I, th- th- we, we've got to get this going hell for leather. Every single Tom, Dick and Harry go shooting sort of have something to do with back British game it's everyone can get on board with this yeah it's exactly it's you know because Eat Wild is predominantly a food marketing business going forwards you know we're not really a shooting organization and so I hope people will see back British game as uh something that everyone can support you know whether you're a cook or a gun a picker up beater doesn't you know it doesn't matter just support back British game and and so the so the, the the revenue from from the the bumper stickers or whatever that all goes into funding the wider eat wild activity is that absolutely. right absolutely yeah yeah nice. exactly really nice it, um it's a controversial comment coming slightly off topic but it reminds me of um, my dad talking about a car sticker he saw in the eighties which was back British manufacturing drive a Japanese car off the road today. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> I mean, times have changed, obviously. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, so we uh, need some stickers, please, Louisa. That would be great. Caps, pin badges, the lot. And then so, so how are you... Do you know yeah, what people yeah, really yeah. like? Garters. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, so I was thinking like T-shirts, though, that say, you know, pheasant has X amount more protein than chicken. I'll have a I'll have a vest. I'll okay, have a wife, wife beaters. beaters. <laughs> yeah, okay. wife beaters yeah. and bucket hats. 
what, what is what is what is your what is your wife beater going to sound it my pheasant is better than your chicken yeah just that yeah that'll do nicely <laughs> <laughs> louisa you and i are going to have to go we'll go to the pub and we will come up with some really good designs <laughs> sounds good to me you look, yeah just just have this all on your website connect it up to that company swag.com and then you just get it on demand printed and delivered to people's door they can have whatever they want Oh, great. Up... <laughs> Are you sponsored by them, Chris? No, I just think it's a brilliant business. It literally catered to that need of like, I want this, but I don't want to buy like 500 of them. Oh, yeah, I, I have actually like... been looking for a fulfillment centre. So maybe oh, that's there you go. just saving swag, me a job. Swag, Swag.com. It's obviously American with a name like that. But anyway, um, well, good luck with Back British Games. So uh, but I, I think I've seen somewhere about the sort of wider fundraising. Are you hoping... Uh, How's that going to work with 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 this? So we'll continue to do our fifty p levy, uh, which I hopefully most people are aware of. You know, it's it's not it's a small cost, but a long term investment is how I like to see it. Uh, and the fifty p levy will still go on any invoices. You know, in the last few years, it's only been shoots that have been registered um, for assurance, but we're obviously opening that up to any shoots that want to support the marketing of game. So. Uh, yeah, any shoots that would like to sign up to the 50p levy on their invoices would really appreciate it. Can syndicates and private shoots join that? Can How can people who aren't on commercial shoots do that? Even if you're just going on a rough shoot, you know, if I some, go look, on a little walkabout and you get three birds, you could just send me £1.50. That would be... What, tape to an envelope? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't... <laughs> <laughs> don't care it, it's anyone that backs british game this isn't about size this is about a future for british game this isn't about oh they shoot more than me or whatever that's all irrelevant you back british game or not yes or no exactly and also i i don't you know the guns have been supporting us for the last few years and i'd love to expand that to clothing manufacturers and everything else so everyone can support it what a good idea do you know that's a really interesting point you know one of the things i think is really interesting about the way that um, hunting works in America is they've got these two um, incredible revenue streams that sort of pour money into the public coffers. One is, um, it's got a really funny name and I can't remember what it is, but there's a tax on all hunting equipment uh, and that money goes directly into the the gate the you know fish and wildlife or whatever the agencies are called in each individual state for conservation work and then the other is obviously hunting licenses and if we could say that you know every time you buy a box of cartridges or every time you buy a new pair of wellies you are helping to promote game that would be an incredible thing absolutely oh, I lo- I'm loving well done Louisa this is epic direction change and it's all logical. I've had amazing people helping me. So you included Chris. So thank you. We've had, you know, and Dylan, Darcy, Will Southall. There's been so many people behind the scenes that are always on the phone to me. But, you know, it's definitely not just me. Yeah, but I mean, it, you, you, you're obviously leading the charge and helping putting it together. So well done. I mean, it, really exciting. And yeah, I think yeah. it just, yeah, it just yeah. I, it's just one of these things that fits nicely. You know, when something clicks and you go, yeah, that makes sense. Those are the, when you keep it simple, those are the things that work. So good luck. Thank you. We'll obviously be supporting it. So, uh, Louisa, the way, no, <laughs> Desert Island shooting is the way that we end these pods. But there's been a bit of recent discussion about it. Uh, uh, George, I have to lead you on this one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, it was suggested in a previous episode that our, um, our the way we introduced this in suggesting that shooting was about to get banned was a bit negative and uh, not all that great. So um, in the previous episode, I suggested that an alternative way into desert island shooting might be that um, you've had a terrible medical diagnosis and you've been given very short t- length of time to live and for some reason matt and chris uh, decided that that wasn't all that much more positive um <laughs> so as a way of introducing this edition and i think all future editions of desert island shooting um i'm going to use this very sensible suggestion from a listener um who's already a member of the order of the garters um they know who they are um thank you very much so so the conceit is this. The extinction level event asteroid hits tomorrow. <laughs> Your affairs are in order. Loved ones and enemies have been reconciled. The dogs are fed and the tomatoes have been watered. Your ha- 
how does your last day begin? <laughs> I love that bit of correspondence. Thank you. <laughs> um, wow. So firstly, I would really just love a day where I haven't had to do any of the cooking because I like to go really all out on elevenses. <laughs> I annoy my husband so much because I, for me, elevenses is like the highlight of the day. Okay, before you go any further, can I ask you what your... Elevens is pièce de résistance is. Oh, my, I, cha- I change it every year because I'm like, oh my god, they can't have the same thing. And he's like, we've got different people, Louisa. They won't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> but obviously, I do a pheasant venison sausage roll, um, Ooh, wow. fe- fe- pheasant cocktail sausages, uh, usually some flapjacks. Uh, I did do like try to do sliders one year, like pheasant sliders. That was just too hard though. If I was shooting, so yeah, I uh, I, eleven days is a big part of my day. <laughs> I agree. It's, it's a it's one of the best parts of the day. Yeah, especially if you've got someone like this putting all the effort in. Uh, <laughs> okay, well, so none I, of that, right? How's how's the... <laughs> but no? So I actually part of my day, which I think I've been thinking about this quite hard. I think I'd like to do like a mixed species day because that I think is usually the most challenging and the most fun and we do it um at Christmas around Jack's uncle just sorry Jack's my husband around his uncle's estate where we all go and I would really love to do that but kind of all over the world and do a different animal in each country that you have to eat that has to be an edible animal that is delicious um and then I would fin and then I'd have 11 so it's probably cooked by someone like Mark Kempson who has WA and the best game chef I think I've ever come across. I ate there last week and it was amazing. It is, it, honest, last week. You kept I, that quiet. I dream, <laughs> I dream about his food. It is amazing. He is, yeah, the best. Highly um, recommended. Yeah, definitely. So uh, he would be cooking for me on my uh, day. <laughs> And, but so, so he's going to stand there at the start of the day and be given order after order from you to exactly what you want and then just go and deliver it. I, I like think it. hopefully he'll surprise me. I don't want to have to think about what's going to to be given okay. to me. But I basically, <laughs> after, every time I've shot something, I'll be given something else to eat. <laughs> um, so, so, yeah. And then I went to finish the day in a pigeon tower just with my husband, Jack. And a nice bottle of wine, I think, would be um, my sort of very nice. Of okay, day. so 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 you're going on your multi-country, multi-species day. Uh, yeah. Which countries? Which species? So I'd like to do like I, I obviously know this is illegal now, but Franklin in Kenya. Very nice. Yeah. So yeah. Straight out with an illegal bit of quarry. Yeah. Cool. Okay. <laughs> oh, but it's obviously I'm allowed to do it because we've flown back in time and. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> yep, fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, <laughs> And then probably go up to Scotland and get a stag. Uh, I really, really want a goat. I don't know where the best place to do that is yet, but maybe we go to the Himalayas. And you do that in Scotland when you get your stag? No, I want. Well, Look, I can fly anywhere. Why would I? <laughs> <laughs> I just was trying to, you know, into this, you know, unquantifiable amount of time I was making it easy for you. But yeah, sure. Go and do a goat somewhere else. <laughs> Obviously, partridge in Spain. So yeah, yep. just it would just be all over the world, different time, centuries, etc. And so th- this is quite cool. I don't think we've ever had anyone sort of choose the dish and the quarry and the country in one. It's like <laughs> their desert island shooting. It's, quite it's cool. very good. I, it's a really nice way of looking at it. I th- I think it's a um, it's a it's a it's how we probably ought to look at it. What do I want to eat? <laughs> and therefore <laughs> <laughs> what do i want to shoot <laughs> yeah basically <laughs> obviously no elephants i you know i can't i don't think they taste very nice not tried it uh, you wouldn't you wouldn't um go back in time uh like owen william was it owen william no it was simon reinhold wanted to go back in time and sample a mammoth steak <laughs> yeah that. he did he did you're right <laughs> yes exactly um... woolly rhino <laughs> I, d- I just don't think I, just I don't think I could kill a mammoth or a rhino. I'm sorry. I think I'm too much of a wuss. <laughs> Not with a spear at any rate. No. Um, <laughs> good. I think that's one of the best ever. Um, I really, really like that. I like the way you've thought about it. It's unique. People haven't gone down that route. So hats off. Well done. <laughs> it's been a fascinating discussion. It's been great, Louisa. Thank you ever so much for joining us.
Oh, thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Louisa. Um, And best of luck with Back British Game. We are all behind you. Thank you. Right. As per usual, there is one final reminder that you can get your hands on a pair of the very exclusive Guns on Pegs podcast shooting sock garters by sending us your shooting dilemmas for us to resolve, or by sending us your unpopular opinions, or by sharing your forgotten drives, or by emailing to tell us that we're absolutely wrong about everything. Just send us an email to pod (laughs) at gunsonpegs.com, and if we read it out in the next episode or any future episode, we will send you some garters. We will be back in a couple of weeks' time when we have had our podcast shoot day with a full report, I expect. We're going to have a lot of lowdown from that, aren't we? Yeah, a lot of fallout, I think, is probably the right (laughs) term. Um, But until we are back with another episode, thank you very much for listening, and goodbye. Goodbye.